Hello, this is Brian Rowe with Mythic MTG Tech and doing one of my first non-magic related posts here. It's actually from a chess puzzle that I put up on my Instagram last week, which is almost all magic followers. Um, I was really inspired to put it here though because of the number of responses that I got on Facebook and on Instagram from magic players. And additionally, I was sitting behind, I believe it was Patrick Chapin in Worlds at PAX, and he was explaining to some other people in the audience what was going on in Paul Beetzel's game to break to the top four for Worlds. And it reminded me a lot of the type of calculations that individuals go through when dealing with tactical situations in chess. He was analyzing each position, looking at the outs that Paul had available to him, and predicting the moves that Paul was gonna make based on his knowledge of the deck list, his knowledge of his opponent's deck list, and the end goal of winning. The parallels in other types of competitive games to Magic are very strong. And I definitely believe that talking about other games and learning how to study games can help you become a better Magic player. So let's jump in with this puzzle. Um, I would put this at a medium difficulty. Uh, this came up in a chess lesson that I was giving earlier or very late last month, and it's white to move. I'm just going to walk through how I would attack this puzzle. Uh, I strongly recommend that you pause for a minute, take less than five minutes, and see if you can figure out what the best move is and what you would play in this situation. Don't spend more than five minutes. It's not about getting a right answer. It's about using the puzzle as a learning experience. Okay, we're back here. First thing I do whenever jumping into a chess puzzle or even over the board, in between each move, I ask myself a series of questions about what's going on in the position. What does the material look like? Who is ahead? We're equal material at this point in time. Black has two bishops versus white's knight and a bishop. So we've got a minor piece imbalance. We've got a very imbalanced pawn structure here with a lot of weaknesses for white, especially around his king. Additionally, we have a development advantage for white. White has basically an extra piece on the board. One of Black's rooks is hiding there in the corner and not able to get involved in the game. Finally, all of White's pieces are pointing at Black's king. So these last two lead in development and possible problems with Black's king safety should act as a huge red light for you saying, hey, there could be a tactic here. And that's where one starts calculating. The first thing that I do in calculating is check the checks, then check the captures, then check the forcing moves. Concretely, we're looking both at each of the knight checks, knight to e7 and knight to f6. Uh, knight to e7 does a solid job of checking, but the queen comes back, takes the knight. We have a similar situation with knight f6, although the queen can't take right away, but the bishop on g7 can grab the knight. So let's look at those super quickly. Not so good. It also picks up the undefended piece here on b7. Another tactical situation to look for is undefended pieces. So the fact that that knight was, or so the fact that the bishop was undefended could also play into the tactic. Let's look at it this way. So after bishop takes, we're merely making an exchange here. Additionally, you've got an interesting situation here, which I would actually calculate this first, but then the bishop comes back and it's difficult to put additional pressure in this situation. So let's go back here to the starting position. The next thing that I look for is forcing moves, moves that kind of increase the pressure because we don't have any checks that work out well and we don't have any captures that work out well. So in forcing moves, this is the one that really throws people off. And when calculating, we've got this blind spot about the queen. 
The queen is the most powerful piece, but she is only a piece. She is not the king. She is not worth holding on to if you can get some type of an advantage. And the primary move here is queen to g6. A lot of people freak out and say, oh wait, but you're going to lose the queen to the pawn. After pawn takes, we've got a super strong follow-up. You check both of the checks in this situation. Knight to f6 and knight to e7. Knight to e7 does not work because it still has an escape square for the king. But by contrast, knight f6 is the same type of double attack here. The bishop and the knight are attacking the king, so the king must move. And the knight on f6 takes control of the h7 square. So the queen cannot be taken here. This is where most stronger players uh, might stop calculating, but you need to see if black has a better defense. Black does in fact have a much better defense, which is bishop takes the knight, bishop takes the knight. Now, Black has to evaluate what's going on in the position and what is White's threat. White's threat right now is that he's got three attackers on the f7 pawn. And the f7 pawn now cannot take the queen because of a absolute pin. There are two types of pins. A relative, where someone could move out of the pin but might lose a piece. And absolute, which are against the king, which leaves black no option to move. Given the number of attackers that are on f7, the queen's got to come back and defend. Once again, the fact that this rook is out of the game allows white to find another tactic here, which is basically exchanging on f7 and then utilizing this absolute pin to win a piece. No matter what black does here, it ends very poorly because there's no way for the rook to get over there to help defend. This check is going to allow a discovered check, and white walks away with the game. So as we go back and look at the starting position here, the main things to pull out of this tactic is, number one, Whenever your positional features really point to there being a possibility of a tactic, you should calculate through. And then, don't just stop at the point of a checkmate. Look for the strongest defense that is possible. Tactical ideas often come together with many different avenues. So not only are we threatening a mate in this situation, but we're also putting an extreme amount of pressure on that F7 pawn. Uh, if you've got any comments, thoughts on this, please let me know. Uh, also, feedback over this type of content is greatly appreciated. I strongly believe that as we talk about other type of game content on this channel, uh, there will be an advantage to people who want to get better at playing Magic competitively. Thanks. This has been Brian Rowe with Mythic MTG Tech. This channel is made possible by patrons like you.